Hello and welcome to Somerville Media Center Live for June 3rd, 2020. I am Joe Lynch. It is my pleasure to welcome back to the School Committee and Superintendent's Update, Chair of the Somerville School Committee, Carrie Norman. And today's special guest is Dr. Jessica Boston Davis. She is the Director for Equity and Excellence for the Somerville Public School District. Welcome to you both on this rather humid afternoon. Dr. Boston Davis, if it's okay with you, um, can we dispense with the formalities and I'll refer to you as Jessica. Yes, that's okay. perfect. <laughs> Jessica, you can even I'm, call me Jess. There you go. Jess, <laughs> how are you and your family doing today? We are, um, we are doing well, all things considered. With, there's a lot going on um, on top of the pandemic. Uh, and so we are doing the best we can and that's what we can do. Terrific. Carrie Norman. Uh, let's, I think since we last, we heard my younger son got his wisdom teeth out. So I, the protocol at an oral surgeon has certainly changed. Uh, it, it keeps, it's a constant reminder of how every aspect of our life will be touched by this. And, uh, I'm excited tonight The the full circle, uh, graduation will be in two parts. Tonight's the virtual and next week they're going to do a, another part, much smaller, fewer people in person. So, um, that's something I'm looking forward to for later today. Terrific. Carrie, I'm going to start, if you don't mind, I'm going to start with um, Dr. Boston Davis and refer to her as Jess. Um, <laughs> I just want to give our, our listeners and our viewers uh, a little setup as to what the Director of Equity and Excellence does. Um, my understanding, it is a rather new position here in the district. Um, so Jess, why don't you take it away and kind of set the table for folks who are going to be uh, watching what we're talking about today. Sure, thank you. Um, so yes, my role is new, Director for Equity and Excellence. Uh, this is its first year, so we're rounding up the first year of existence, but this is actually my second year working in the Somerville Public Schools. When I was finishing my doctorate, I worked in the capacity of a resident, um, and so I was the superintendent fellow was my title in the district, and so I learned with um, right under Mary Skipper, but also my project was primarily working with the school committee. And so we worked together that year in the um, kind of creation of the equity policy that is currently in existence. And um, that was a good chunk of work that led, that really laid the foundation for, for my role now. And so my role now as the Director for Equity and Excellence, um, I work across the district um, with every school leader, um, with students, with families, um, just really thinking about how to advance equity and when i say that how are we ensuring it? so there is um, a beautiful uh definition of equity in the school committee's policy that we spent a long time crafting but if i'm going to you know make it quick for for this for this time we're really thinking about how we're meeting the needs of all of our students um, how we're meeting the needs of all of our students regardless of fill in the blank so regardless of race, regardless of ethnicity, regardless of socioeconomic status, regardless of um, language acquisition status, regardless of uh, ability, uh, disability, um, just really making sure that we're able to meet um, our students' needs. And the list goes on and on. And we know that we're intersectional people. So, you know, we have many layers of identity there. Um, and I don't mean to, to separate out all the groups, but considering all of that, uh, what my role looked like this past year was really working with all of the principals and their ILTs, their instructional leadership teams, which is a group of teacher leaders in their schools, and planning professional development. And the, there's a lot of other stuff, but I think that I'll stop there. Jess, thank you. I mean, it lays out exactly what I think the listeners need to understand when we have the conversation going forward. But if you don't mind, I'm going to flip it back to the chair of the school committee, who I will hear from if I don't give her time to do the update <laughs> on um, graduation plans, uh, back to school plans, summer camp, summer school, all the rest of it. Carrie, anything since last week that we've got um, an update? Uh, so graduation plans, there's more. Uh the eighth grade move up ceremonies to some schools are trying to figure schools are trying to figure out how do we celebrate our kids, especially at all the different transitions. We are uh, ending this year and also planning a lot for next year. Uh, our numbers, our enrollment numbers were uh, before we went out on the pan pandemic uh, was up 
almost 300 students. And so uh, enrollment is going to be a really interesting thing that we're going to have to pay attention to over the summer. Who's here? Who's coming back? Who's not? What are the needs of our individual students, our educators? So uh, camps, uh, the, the city has said that they're going to open some of the rec camps, but in a more limited fashion. Uh, it's my understanding kids don't necessarily know yet who's going to be working, who's going to be attending. A number of our community partners are going to be doing virtual summer camp. And I think for most of our families, um, the summer seems like a, in some ways this big abyss because we, we don't know yet. And what we know is um, summer loss, learning loss is huge and it'll be further compounded by the situation we're in. And then one more thing, Carrie, that uh, somebody asked me over this past weekend, um, what has the pandemic emergency done to the completion of the high school, the new high school? Oh, okay. So beginning of March, we had over 300 uh, workers there every day. Uh, during the pandemic, that number went drastically lower. We've had to there's a nurse on site every day taking temperatures. You can only have so many people and it needs to be or coordinated very carefully so that they're socially distanced throughout the building. We're hoping to be able to ramp up. Um, we are not gonna be in the building in September. That was, uh, we were on track for that before the pandemic. I would hope that we would be able to get in there for January. Um, but it's certainly, there's things that we don't know yet because there's, you know, there's parts of construction equipment, you know, the bleacher seats are, I think somewhere still in the Midwest, uh, there's a lot more uh, coordination of resources. And now when we go back, it's not just the, the high school as planned, it's now gonna have to be a high school that's planned to be safe during a pandemic. So more to come. So in a nutshell, there are two major issues that have disrupted the planned reopening. A, the pandemic with its um, health guidelines that were issued. Right. Slowing down the, the actual Slowing down the actual construction. construction yes. And, uh, the actual construction. And then we have a supply chain issue. Where yes, supply ordered. chains have been interrupted for sure. Okay. Okay. So, you know, hopefully people understand these are things that are outside of the city of Somerville's control. Um, Jess, I want to go back to you. And it is, um, it's been at the forefront of my mind for over a week, um, which is, how children in this country, black or white, are reacting to the murder of, I say murder, I think it was the murder um, of Mr. George. And how do we weave this moment in time into our education system? What do parents tell their kids that are watching this on TV? How do teachers weave this into their either virtual or in-person learning in the future? I'm, I'm gonna stop with my editorializing and I, I wanna take it from you, if you yeah, wanna take it you. away. Yeah, so, I mean, I think the first thing, there's, there's a lot there. So one, uh, the first thing is uh, the acknowledgement that this is happening, okay? Um, the acknowledgement of the murder that we saw, and it's shown on, on I saw it with my son on my lap in, in, on the five o'clock news. So it's, it's everywhere, you know, um, beyond social media. Um, and so just a, the acknowledgement that uh, seeing that has a dramatic impact on everyone, regardless of who you are in the country. And I think that's why we're seeing so, and in the world, I think that's why we're seeing such a huge reaction um, because, and shoot, because it's had ripple effects on everyone. Uh, that was not an easy thing to watch. I still haven't brought myself to watch all of it, nor do I think I will, because I think it's a bit traumatic and um, traumatizing. Um, uh, that said, um, I, uh, uh, there's plenty of research that shows that, that children at very young ages recognize race recognize difference. Um, our like I said, our kids um, have might even have seen this on the news. So it, in terms of before I go to the kind of schools, it's, it is okay to talk to your kids about race. In fact, I would say it's important to talk to your kids about race because, and difference and, you know, the d diversity that we see in our community in Somerville and across the world, because 
kids realize it. And so it's important to talk about it so that it's an okay thing to know about. Um, there are so many articles I see, and I'm actually happy to share some, but there's so many articles that I see kind of floating around right now, like, um, you know, 25 children's books that you can buy to help talk to your kids about race and difference and injustice. Um, there are, uh, I saw today that Sesame Street is having a town hall on, um, sat on Saturday to talk to kids about uh, injustice and race. So there's a lot of uh, things that if you don't feel comfortable to support you, either books, articles, Sesame Street, that can help you talk about this. So that said, um, with the district, we have been thinking about, uh, first of all, it was really great to get the mayor and the superintendent's um, acknowledgement and strong stance against uh, racism and any, for that matter, any kind of um, oppression and, and ism, I guess, uh, within, within our city and within our system, our school system. Um, and from there, we, as at the district, uh, we had an just happened to have it planned and, and really scratched the agenda just to respond to the situation An administrators meeting on Monday where uh, we charged everyone to really think about the immediate, the short term and the long term um, actions that we will take in our community. Um, so immediate and, and before I start, before I, I go into deep, the details about those uh, things, I also want to say there are we have such incredible teachers and there are so many teachers and other staff members, paraprofessionals, there's so many staff members and educators within our system that have also kind of taken on this on their own, um, you know, gathering resources, holding groups of, for students um, to process together, um, just kind of texting students back and forth if they feel comfortable doing that. So I just want to acknowledge that. Um, and now I can talk from the, the district kind of system perspective, but there's a lot of really great work going on um, with some incredible educators. Uh, so that said, in the immediate, I think it starts with, so you asked kind of like, what do, where do we go from here? I think it starts with the acknowledgement, right? We can't hold business as usual. We can't be surprised if students aren't engaging in the ways that we thought or may engage differently and feel upset. And there's a reason why. Um, so it starts with acknowledgement. Um, and from that acknowledgement, we also want to create space in this immediate time. So we're working right now with organizations. I just got off a call with Teen Empowerment in Somerville, um, en route, uh, different organizations to really help us facilitate conversations for students. Um, so we're going to have more details to come because I just got off the call, uh, but we'll have uh, focus groups in um, town hall style meetings, not focus groups, town hall style meetings with teen empowerment um, and en route so that we can do them also in Spanish and in Portuguese. Um, so students can just kind of come together in the way that we can't really because we're not in school, but we can virtually come together and express how they're feeling um, in community with one another. And Jess, let me ask you a question. Mm -hmm. Teen Empowerment is one of the Somerville Media Center's community partners. Great. How are we going to reach beyond um, that group that, that uh, Sean Post and his, his fellow uh, instructors? Mm -hmm. How do we reach down into the, the uh, younger kids that are yeah. asking questions about, mom, what's happening on TV? Why are these mm -hmm. people protesting? Why is it so important that all the television stations are covering this? Yeah, so we as so what I've done also is compiled a, lit, a long list of resources for our educators. The hope there is that they're able to also share those with families, um, some of which are the books that I mentioned and the um, uh, Sesame Street, I couldn't remember the name of the show, although it plays in my house a thousand times a day, um, in the Sesame Street um, town hall, but also um, really like talking points for, for parents to how, how can you have a conversation like this with your kids? Um, so we have those available as resources. Uh, Lisa Q, who's the um, director of early ed in the district, um, and her team have made really great resources for young kids talking about at the age of three um, and supporting them and having conversations. Um, and I know she shared that with uh, 
everyone who works with young, young students um, the, within the schools to share with the families as well. So there are a lot of resources like that also being developed uh, because I hear you in that the middle school and teenage age are important, but we also need to be having these conversations um, with, with our kids, with our youngest, with our youngest ones. So do we have expectations when you say immediate? Do we have expectations that those are going to launch sometime this month? next month you know, oh yeah kind of oh yeah um, within that, the next couple of weeks mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. okay yeah okay. because i mean here we are like this is the moment right now um and uh whether we're ready to respond or not our students are are taking in all of this information i think it's really important you know there's a tension as educators um to take the time and want to make sure that something is done right um and thoughtfully and also to respond to the urgency of now and um so we're trying to do both of those things at the same time um but uh yeah we're, we're thinking of the next week or so just let me let me flip this back over to carrie for one second carrie something that i've been thinking about because i have at least three within my immediate family who are graduating high school this year Mm -hmm. And I've spoken to at least two of them. One of them is at a distance, but I've spoken to at least two of them. And in addition to their being brokenhearted, that a lot of their, you know, end of year and their commencement and their proms and all, yeah. the, you know, they're unable to say goodbye in any, um, my word, meaningful way. There's no hugs. There's no tears that are going to be shed together. One of the things that I'm, I'm fearful of is that the education system is releasing these young adults into the wide world. And you kind of no longer have responsibility for their education. They're moving into higher ed, either college or trade schools or whatever. How do they, or are there resources that any of us, whether our organization, the media center or education system, are there going to be any resources for these young adults to process what's happening today and this summer? Um, uh, so, uh, like so many things uh, in Somerville, is and certainly during this pandemic, some of it we're making up as we go along, and in informal structures, and then continuing on uh, in more formal structures, uh, and certainly there's no way we can we come back to school next year and not talk about uh you know we actually have a whole transition plan or it's, it's starting to work on a transition plan how do you bring kids back in right how do we talk about what happened to us the the pandemic what uh this, this i i agree with you joe i would call it a murder uh how do we help kids process those things together and then also come together and get i mean just settling kids back into school is going to be difficult uh i uh, I have always been amazed how many kids come back to Somerville High School and how generous and and heartfelt uh, our educators and members of our community. I'm sure you have the same experience as uh, high school kids graduate and young adults. They venture out in the world and then they come back. Um, I I end every speech uh, if it's a move up ceremony or you know going to high school please come back because we care about you and we want to know how you're doing uh, i think this year more than ever um i know well now we don't know exactly when it's going to happen principal lagabina at the high school is planning an event to be able to bring back this year's graduating seniors in some capacity um we'll have to wait for guidance on how to be able to do that. But that idea of uh, closure, uh, and I don't mean closure as, you know, you're done, you're out of here, but to say, you know, this was a big experience, you've grown up, this is an incredible transition. Um, transitions are both exciting and they can be daunting at the same time. And I think if you're a senior going out into the world now with so much uncertainty, it is especially daunting. And so that, those connections to our community um, are gonna be even more important. And I, I will echo what Jess said, it's our educators. And when I say educators, I mean everybody, classroom teachers, 
secretaries, uh, paras, uh, food workers helping prepare the food, the grab and go meals, everybody. Um, you never know which adult a kid is going to latch onto, but whoever that adult is, is really important. And I have to say as a community, we have been uh, embracing our kids as best we can with open hearts. Um, that said, there's still some kids that we have that we're losing contact with and we need to work, uh, we're working hard, but even harder to maintain those connections to yeah. school. Yeah, that's kind of where I was going is, you know, these older educate, uh, these older kids in school who are yeah. on the precipice of being adults, where do they go for help after this? But let's go back to Jess. Jess, you were describing some of the immediate things, then you have a short list and a long list. You wanna take over on the short list side? And continue on? Sure, and actually I don't have a, a list of things, but just a way that um, schools, departments, classroom teachers are thinking about uh, what their supports look like in the short term. So what does that mean? What does support look like over the summer for students who are really coping and need healing um, after these events that we've, we've all kind of witnessed, um, and staff, frankly. Um, and then more longer term, we're thinking about what does it mean? So I'll say this, we, we the systems, um, I'll use an analogy given in a book. Uh, so Beverly Daniel Tatum describes uh, racism and oppression really as smog that we're all breathing in. We are all breathing it in and it impacts all of our systems. And it's kind of like, even if you, don't want to, you're breathing it in. She also kind of has this conveyor belt um, analogy where unless you are actively, you would actively step off kind of like the moving sidewalk that you see in the airport, unless you actively step off of that, um, you know, systems and structures, regardless of not if what is your intention will still kind of perpetuate these uh, systems of oppression. Um, and I, I say that because even though what we witnessed was something uh, that happened that didn't happen necessarily in the field of education, I think there are implications and kind of like things that can translate over into what's happening in our schools. And so when I think about the longer term, I think about how are we examining everything from, and this is something that I we're working on, but how are we examining everything from our curriculum to um, our professional development to make sure that we are all doing the work that promotes um, you know, a bias-free education, one that supports and uplifts and encourages all of our students. Yeah, I, I think you know, part of what we're experiencing now, whether it be the pandemic or it be the murder of Mr. George, I think what I'm looking at now is I have never at my age, over 65, thank you very much, I have never experienced some of the feelings that I'm feeling, mainly due to the pandemic. But then, because I did live through the 1960s, I did live through discrimination of my friends in the military, when I was in the military. You know, white Southerners looking at me with a sideways glance because I was walking with two black soldiers. It, what is, I had never experienced that prior to that. Now I'm seeing it again, 40 years later, and it's not the first time I've seen it. You know, and it's, why is it that we are in 2020 still having the conversation about racism, overt racism? There are subtle ways that it's done, and there are the more overt ways. And why is it that we are still doing this? I don't understand it. So I think these types of conversations need to happen today, not tomorrow, not when the media tells us it's okay, not when they have specials, not when there's a commission. And, and I said it yesterday on the city council update, what disturbs me the most is the lack of leadership coming from the top. All the rest of us are there. We are trying our best to get done what we need to get done. But if there is no leader, we're an army 
marching in the fields and we have no direction. We know where we want to go, but there's no leader helping us to get there. That's my soapbox. I'm sorry for doing that, but it's the way I feel. Carrie, yeah. right. let's, let's move forward a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. We probably have about two minutes left. Um, I'm going to ask you the most difficult question of all. Since you and Mary Skipper were on the show a couple of weeks ago, yes. parents are still asking, is there a possibility of our kids going back to school in September? They will go back to school. What exactly that will look like, I cannot say. I, 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 there, we understand the social isolation is doing to kids. Um, there's a lot of variables. Uh, I would say th this is, I think you were referring to national uh, leadership. The state leadership, they're still trying to figure it out, but the, the mechanics and logistics of a school is not necessarily their strong suit. Mayor Curtitoni is going to use some of the CARES Act to hire a consultant to help us figure out how to bring back kids and teachers safely. And we know that we need to. I mean, there's going to be questions. Do you bring back the younger ones who should be less time on screen time? Do you bring, uh, how do you balance the needs of, uh, do you do a rotating schedule? There's all kinds of logistical questions that we don't know yet, but we know the importance of uh, the need to see the kids to see each other and certainly for the adults to see the kids. Um, isolation is just compounding all of these problems. And, and certainly when we have a national crisis or a continuation or a revealing of what we've known has already been there, however you want to characterize what's going on now, uh, the best place to be able to talk about it, I, I think, is at home, but also in our schools. And we need our kids and our adults need to be able together to be able to have these conversations it's you know teenagers they're doing it they're texting electronic but it's not the same as having it in person okay. so there's a lot of preparation prepper you know we're, we're planning uh and and more to come as we we're still finishing up this year we're all in that mode and I know that uh, both of you have Herculean jobs ahead of you. I want to thank Dr. Jessica Boston Davis for joining us today. Thank As you always, for having me and my son's you. guest appearance. Thank you. <laughs> I thank you. Tell him he can come on next time. I'll give him 28 okay, minutes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> As always, Carrie Norman, thank you so much. Thank for you, Somerville, Joe. For Somerville Media Center, I'm Joe Lynch. Stay safe, stay informed. We'll see you next time.